Hello Matrix and welcome to another video and let us put an end to this chemistry of November 2020 physical science uh, from the IEB. Okay, I know it's been long overdue but I got a little busy so I couldn't do this so let's just end it now. Okay, question 8 reads, um, in order to investigate the relationship between the molecular mass of various fluoroalkanes and their boiling point. So what is the investigation all about? It is the relationship between the molecular mass and boiling point. And what is our reference species is fluoroalkanes. Okay. Now Jerome collects the data shown in the table below. All right, so we can see all of that. So that is easy. So you can have your data already organized into a table and then it makes a bit of sense. Now the question says, identify the predominant intermolecular force in fluoromethane. Okay, now let's have a look at fluoromethane and be able, of course, you should know this from theory, but um, these are some of the things that create a few issues. Come on camera, don't be blurry on me here. So this can create a few issues, so a lot of people can mistake this. So let's look at the myth fluoromethane. Let's put the fluorine over there. So this is the structure of fluoromethane, okay? And as you can see here, carbon draws the bonding pairs towards itself because if you're looking at your periodic table over here, what will you see is that the electronegativity of carbon compared to that of oxygen. So this one is more electronegative than hydrogen. But of course, the difference is not so much significant such that you can say this is completely stripping the hydrogen of the electrons. But we are going to have a partially positive partially positive situation over there. But we know that fluorine is more electronegative than carbon, so it's four. So this one is going to be definitely a negative end. And then look at that. So if we're looking at our molecule, so we'll have this partially positive end, and then this strongly negative end. So basically what do we have here? A dipole. Okay, this creates a dipole and then if we put another molecule next to this one the right orientation of course and then we have the fluorine here and then of course the same situation happens here so we will have this partially positive end and then this negative end okay so what are we going to do we know that well the likelihood is this partially positive hydrogen one, any one of these will actually form this bond with that negative end of the next molecule. And then what is that bond? This bond is a dipole, dipole interaction. Okay, dipole, dipole interaction. Great. That is the answer to our first question here. So we have here dipole, dipole forces. Okay, that's how you get your two marks. Of course, you can already cram this one. You know that all haloalkanes, they have dipole, dipole forces. Okay, but someone may say, hmm, but we have a problem. We know for a fact that when we have hydrogen bonding covalently to fluorine, or just say this combination, we were told that this must be a hydrogen bond. Okay, so now how is that one different from this one? Well, the first thing is, this is an end of a whole molecule and then another end of a whole molecule. These ones electrostatically will attract each other like that. So this is much weaker than this covalent bond. But let's just focus on our hydrogen bonding so that we are clear about it. So for a hydrogen bond, there's one little constraint, should I say, or condition. 
So there is a very strict condition for one to form a hydrogen bond. And what is that condition? The condition is that the hydrogen atom must be covalently bonded to a small and highly oops electro negative atom okay so for a hydrogen bond to form the H atom or the hydrogen atom must be bonded to a small but highly electronegative atom. Which ones are these ones? This can be nitrogen, can be oxygen, can be fluorine, can also have chlorine there. All right. As you can see here, the electronegativity is quite significant here, such that the difference is more than 0.5. Okay. So this is great. So any one of these, one, two, three, four, they will form relatively stronger uh, bonds such that the electrons are stripped away from this hydrogen atom almost to the other side. So that is strongly positive and strongly negative ends. And therefore the forces are much stronger than these ones which are a little bit weaker. Okay. So this is the main condition. So that means the hydrogen atom that participates in a hydrogen bond must itself be covalently bonded to either nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or chlorine. Now you know you cannot say this is a hydrogen bond because look at the hydrogen that is taking place in this uh, situation. Let me just get a color. So look at this hydrogen here. Do you see what is it bonded to covalently, to carbon? And if you're looking at the electronegativity of carbon, it's 2.5. So the difference between the two is, oh, is 0.4, which is really insignificant. You only take 0.5 and more, isn't it? So you can already tell that, well, because this carbon, I mean, this hydrogen that is taking place into this is partially positive, is not strongly positive then we know this cannot be a hydrogen bond. So rather, this is just the negative end of this molecule pulling the other positive end of this molecule. And then of course, the likely participant is these hydrogens, but they are only bonded to carbon, not these ones. So these are not hydrogen bonds, okay? Maybe let's explore this a little bit further to try and expand our approach. Now let's have a look at alcohols. Let's just take methanol. Of course, I'm going to bend this one and make the hydrogen be there. Okay, so this is methanol. You could make it straight, but I'm just bending it because I need something out of it, all right? Okay, so what would be the situation here? So what we're going to have here is a situation like this and then let's say we're going to have another hydrogen here from the next molecule okay so I can make this one straight I mean I can make this one straight I don't have to bend it but I can bend it if I like but let's make this one straight because that's what we want now of course you know Oxygen is mostly electronegative, so it pulls that bonding pair towards itself so that this side is strongly negative, okay? Because it takes an electron from this and then an electron from that one, so it becomes a two minus, so to speak. And then, of course, the other ends are relatively positive. As you would know that this is going to be partially positive, partially positive, and then, of course, strongly positive. And the same is the story here. Okay, but what is the story now? The reality is this hydrogen, do you see this hydrogen? It's covalently bonded to an oxygen, which is one of the small atoms that are highly electronegative. And it is therefore strongly positive, 
compared to the other hydrogens, right? And then it will be drawn towards this strongly negative end of the other molecule. And you can tell that, well, because of that, that is called a hydrogen bond, okay? So that is how a hydrogen bond forms in so-called primary alcohols. Of course, depending on how many OH groups you have in your alcohols, then you'll form as many hydrogen bonds as you can. Okay, easy stuff. So you can see that, well, the participating hydrogen in a hydrogen bond beat an intermolecular force or intramolecular force. Remember, this covalent bond is an intramolecular force, but this one is an intermolecular interaction. So hydrogen is bonded covalently to a strong electronegative small atom like oxygen or any one of the other ones. Then when it is therefore drawn to the next molecule on the negative end, what you would have is a hydrogen bond as an intermolecular force. Of course, this one is much weaker than the intramolecular force of the same order. All right, easy stuff. Now let's take another example. Let's take methanoic acid. All right, so I'm just going to put my hydrogen right down here. Uh, methanoic acid is O. Uh, let's just put our hydrogen here. Let's just bend this one a little bit more. So we're going to have our hydrogen over there. All right, we're just bending it, nothing, nothing bad. And then we put another methanoic acid. Then we're just going to bend this one also. Say oxygen and then we bend. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 what are you doing, Wenerman? No, 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 no. Let's put a double bond there. Okay, and then we do the same here and put the oxygen over here and then we bend the hydrogen and place it over there and then of course we have another methanoic acid now remember this is stripped by the oxygen because the bond is directed towards this oxygen making this one mostly negative right and what happens this one draws two electrons they're also making this one mostly negative so these two will attract because this is strongly positive, this is strongly negative. Then they will attract like that, okay? So look at that. What is this hydrogen here? This hydrogen is covalently bonded to oxygen while it participates in this intermolecular uh, electrostatic force with the next molecule's negative end. So this becomes a hydrogen bond. So this is hydrogen bond number one, number two. Let's look at another hydrogen bond that is possible here. It's going to happen there because remember this is covalently bond to oxygen. So the electron shed is pulled more to the oxygen such that this is strongly positive and then that is strongly negative. And then these two will therefore attract each other. Again, look at that hydrogen it is itself covalently bonded to a small but highly electronegative atom. So that is one. So do you see those two sides? They are both hydrogen bonds. Okay? Hydrogen bonds. So remember these ones have two sides. Here, depending on is how many um, OH groups or hydroxyl groups you have, then you'll have as many. But if we just consider the basic molecules like that, where you just have one for each, this one has two sides when this one has only one side. Okay, great stuff. Now, to I just want to show you the last one quickly before we move on, because I want you to understand hydrogen bonds. Please pay attention to this condition. So these are some of the things when you revise, you want to sit on and not waste time doing other things. Now let's take an ester, for example. Let's take a methyl methanoate. Okay, great. So we have here methyl methanoate, right? So I don't know where we're going to put our stuff here. Let me try it. Let me just see what I can do about it because I really want this one not to become an issue for us. 
just want to do it nice and easy okay so let's just do the double bond this side and then the hydrogens this side and then of course we know that it's going to have some oxygen you know uh, bonded remember this one is bonded to 18 of um, what can I say let's just put methyl group here okay there's methyl group over there so this is methyl methanoate we just want to investigate what type of intermolecular interactions do we have here and let's put another one side by side this one okay so what I can do with this one uh, I'm gonna try to be very crafty indeed I'm gonna be crafty a little bit um, let's just try and be crafty I want to be crafty a lot okay we're going to put here another one how am I going to put this one? See, these things can be a nightmare if you're not careful. So, it is trying to defeat me now. It's trying to defeat me. But I want this end of this other molecule. Uh, let's do it this way. Let's put another one over here and say there is C, H, and then we have our double bond over there, and then we have another oxygen, and then that methyl group over there. Spare that we are encroaching onto the other side. I didn't plan my stuff very well. So forget about this other one over there. Forget about that one. So do you see this molecule is the same as this one? So what happens here? Look at this. This is strongly negative, right? Because it pulls electrons towards it so that it becomes a 2 minus. This one is partially positive because the bond is directed to the carbon, but the carbon is not so strongly electronegative. So this is not really strongly positive, but you will have an interaction over there and another one there, okay? So now with these esters, what do you see? you have here this is partially positive this is strongly negative so all you have these are simply dipole dipole forces okay why are they dipole dipole forces look at the hydrogens that are participating in those bonds what is this hydrogen covalently bonded to to carbon and it's not any one of these mostly electronegative atoms and the same story applies here this hydrogen that takes place in in this intermolecular force as well is actually covalently bonded to carbon and not nitrogen or oxygen or fluorine or chlorine so these are dipole dipole forces don't say hydrogen bonding okay that's not the case although this is an interaction between hydrogen and oxygen end of each molecule but you're looking at what this hydrogen is covalently bonded to as an intramolecular force. So you can already appreciate now that these are not hydrogen bonds. This one over here, okay? Not a hydrogen bond, uh, but hydrogen bonds are these ones because the hydrogens that are participating are covalently bonded to either oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine, and therefore you can appreciate why these haloalkanes only have dipole-dipole interactions because there's hydrogens that take place in the intermolecular forces are essentially not covalently bonded to any one of these but to carbon which is really not so much of a huge significant difference in their electronegativities. All right guys, I hope you understood that one. I felt the need to explain how a hydrogen bond needs to be formed. 
So the condition is that the hydrogen atom must be covalently bonded. It's a matter of your must, guys. It's not a suggestion. It's not whenever you feel like situation, but this must happen before you can say you have hydrogen bonds. That explains why alcohols and carboxylic acids have hydrogen bonds, but esters do not, as well as haloalkanes. Okay, great stuff. I hope that was easy enough to follow. So, let's just not waste time. We have a lot of work upon ourselves. Uh, next question says, um, is fluorobutane a gas or liquid at room temperature? Remember, we know butane is a gas, right? But question is, what about fluorobutane? Remember, you're adding another uh, substance there. The higher the molecular formula, the more uh, solid or liquid it will be. So this one will approach the liquid phase, but let's have a look. Uh, fluorobutane has a mass of 76, okay? And then let's look at the boiling point, it's 33. So what happens at 25 degrees Celsius? I mean, it is very close to its melting, I mean, to boiling point. So you can't boil a, a gas or you can't boil a, what do you call, a solid. But it must have melted already into liquid. So the best form is liquid because it's very close to its boiling point. So at room temperature, it must be liquid. So that is very easy. Now, plot a graph of boiling point versus molecular mass for the given data on the axis provided on your answer sheet. Draw a straight line of the best fit. I like this part. So you may think you are done with statistics in your paper one. Well, you got it wrong because here it is required. It is required. All right. So let's get the grid over there and work on it. So once you have a grid like that, first of the thing, first, of, first and foremost, what are your x's going to be? Already here, they're making it easy for you. They're saying molecular mass. I mean, they should not. They should give you a chance to actually decide because you know what is dependent and what is independent. And always the standard way of depicting this on a graph is you take the independent on the x-axis and the dependent on the y-axis. Now what depends on what here? You can already tell that the higher the molecular mass, the higher the boiling point. So the boiling point depends on the molecular mass. Hence they put this one here so they make it easy. So you already know that here you're going to have the boiling point because it depends. So what is this in? Is in degrees Celsius. Okay, Celsius or Celsius. Great stuff. Now we've identified our y-axis and they've already identified for us the x-axis. And let's look at the numbers now. This is 34, 48, 76, 90. So this is even numbers. And if you look here, we are seeing 20, 40. Sometimes they should leave this alone so that you sweat it a bit, but they're making your life a bit easier. They're giving you something to work with. So if you have 20, how much is the small block? Of course, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So just say 20 divided by 10. So that means each small block is just two units. Okay, so that's a 2 over there. So you sort it. So you know this is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So here you have 10. Then you're going to have 30. Going to have 50. 70, sorry. And 90 over there. All right. Great. So there they are. Now let's look at the vertical axis. What are they giving us? They didn't do anything here. So they're leaving you to sweat a little bit. But let's look at the range. It's 60 to 70. Okay, minus 78 to about 60. So it's fine. If we do this, say 20 here. Then this is 40. This is 60. That is 8. Okay. So this is going to be minus 20, minus 40, minus 60, minus 8. But then if we're saying this little big block is 20 units, then what is a small block? How many there are? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 
so if they are 5 20 by 5 is 4 so we know that the small block is 4 units and then of course we have 0 day at the origin all right guys the next thing what should the topic be we can say here this is the boiling point you always state the y-axis first we have boiling point versus molecular mass for I mean these are all short chains so for short chain fluoro fluoro alkanes okay not a problem so that is your topic again this is mark worthy don't take it for granted all right now let's have a look at our graph how do we plot then very easy now the plotting part is easy once the scale is sorted so the first one says we are plotting 34 against minus 78 okay 34 so where is 34 2 4 so there is 34 over here so we're plotting it against minus 78 and then of course here we're going in fours so obviously this one is going to be very close to that line because this line this is 60 64 66 64 sorry 64 68 72 and then this is 76 over here so we're looking for 78 so 78 is very close to this line so we're just gonna put it there and say that is the one so it's it's quite close to that line so there's our dot for 78 and 34 then the next one is 48 and 38 48 is this one over here and minus 38 sorry yeah minus 38 what is it a, a, a. 48 okay 48 and minus uh, 38 so this is 20 24 28 32 uh, 36 so 38 should be here minus 38 so this is 36 over here so very close to this line very close to this line so we're going to put our dot over there and say there it is okay not a pro not a problem and then let's look at the next one so this is 76 and plus 33 okay so 76 ish. Yeah, this thing is gonna take a bit of time 76 so 246 over here all right so use your ruler so that you don't lose your path otherwise it's gonna be tears 246 okay 76 and then it goes with plus 33 so this one is 24 28 uh, 32 and then 36 so just above the 30 second line so let's follow it all the way to our line. so it's gonna be almost there okay almost on that line I mean I'm using a big pen so it's going to kind of overlap some lines there then the next one is 90 and 63 so this is this line over here so it's much easier to work with don't even need a ruler there so this is what 63 okay so this is 60 64 63 is just before so we can put it right underneath that line okay not a problem you can almost tell that this relationship is linear these are forming almost a straight line but then how do you do this do you join these two or do you join those two what do you do or you just draw some imaginary line I mean to draw an imaginary line is probably the best thing to do but it's gonna get you wrong answers so the first thing that you need to do here remember this is bivariate data 
isn't it a smaller mass against boiling point so here you want your equation Okay, so that is the best thing you can do. All right, so let's just quickly do it. So you go to mode here, and then you go to option three, which is statistics, and then look at option two there. That is your line of the list, squares regression line. So let's choose option two. And option two gives us nicely our table. So we just punch this. On the X, the dependent, the independent, it's 34. Press equal sign. Next one is 48 equal sign. That one is 76 equal sign. Then the last one is 90, which is the fourth one, right? Great. Then you use this arrow to cross over. You go to the top. Ah, uh, don't do it. So once you see one there, you know that is the very top. Actually, it's not. Yeah, there is the very top. It's 34. So 34 goes with minus 78, okay? So you just put it as it is, minus 78 equals sign. Go to the second one, 48 went with minus 38. And uh, 76 went with 33. And then our 90 went with 63. So there's our date, and then you just hit your AC button to store. Then you go to shift and then you go to stats which is just option one and then you go to option five for regression just press five over there then you can choose we want our y-intercept which is a our y-intercept is coming out as minus one six one let's just say comma three because these are all insignificant comma three Okay, we can already see it's going to be a positive gradient, so I can already put a plus over there. All right, not a problem. So let's work nicely. We are almost done there. And then again, we go back. I mean, it's just going to be this tedious process. I don't know what is the best way to, to, do, it, uh, to do it quickly. So you go to option two now. We want B, which is your gradient. Then when we hit there, we're getting 2.5. So this is 2,5x. So our equation is complete. Now this is our equations, I mean our line of the least squares regression. So you do this. Don't try to approximate things too much. You're going to get it wrong. So do this one. This is the most accurate way you can. So don't think your bivariate statistics techniques are to be forgotten. Never. They are here to stay, Baba. And then now, what do we want? We need to draw the line. How are we going to do it? Well, we can see the y-intercept is falling off our grid, so we don't need it. But our x-intercept is within the grid. So let's just say x-intercept implies that y equals 0. This implies that now we have 2,5x minus, we can just put that one, 161,3 equals zero therefore x is going to be equal to so I just transpose this one becomes one six one comma three divide by two point five of course we round it off so you're gonna have to be careful so we get sixty four point five okay so we're getting sixty four point five okay that is our x-intercept when y is 0. So where is that? 64, this is 2, 4. Point 0.5 is right in between. So we are interested in the middle number. So this number is a bit thickish, so it's going to cause me problems. So remember that one does not really exist. So you want to be very careful when you do this one. So that point is our x-intercept. We just need yet another point to get this right. Let's choose 70. So let's see what would be y when x is 70. It's going to be minus 1, 6, 1, comma, 3, plus 2, comma, 5 into 70. So remember, we want a line that is going to fall on this particular line. So that's why we choose any value, but substitute here. So we have minus 161,3 plus 2,5 into 70. 
I get 13.7 which is roughly 14 okay let's just look at this one where is 13.7 so we have 4 8 12 uh, 16 so 12 is here so 13 is probably just above so let's just say 14 maybe miss, let's put it halfway and say this is roughly 14 we put it over there and remember these two lines these two points over here did not exist but we are using them as means to an end so we want to draw our list squares regression line so that we capture those points of course it's not going to be exactly accurate but it gives me what I need afterwards so there we are so now we were able to draw a line by just getting two collinear points and then we are able to do our thing because my ruler you need to have a ruler that is longer than this otherwise the lines tend to angulate and create an uncomfortable situation for you here's my cover all right guys um i know this is taking time but i need you to know this one very well so this point was part of this it was part of the story this one falls on the line slightly close to the line so can you see the points that were original are these black ones those two they were not but we had to use them so that we can get our line okay so statistics guys bivariate data how you handle it in mathematics that's exactly the same we're going to do it so here it is applied not going to be awarded marks specifically for doing it but it's a, it's a means to an end meaning you need to know it to answer your problems okay so we've drawn our graph we've labeled our axis they've already done that one we did we marked them we put our topic so that is our six marks essentially for everything so i suppose two marks for the topic two marks for naming and essentially doing the scale over there and say a mark for the line maybe yeah mark for the points and the line because look where it came from so two marks so that's how you score those six marks okay let's quickly answer these next few questions so that we can try and speed up our approach now now the question says jerome wants to use the data he collected to determine the boiling point of uh, flora propane use the graph that you drew in eight point three to determine the boiling point and indicate clearly on your graph how you arrived at your answer okay well let's look at this one what is chlorobutane so chlorobutane i mean propane sorry it's c3 h7 f isn't it they've already given us the molecular formula right and then what is its molar mass because we need its molar mass okay they used u so let's use the u as well okay what will be its molar mass of course what do we have there carbon is 12 so it's 12 times 3 plus 7 for hydrogens plus what is that of fluorine it's 19 so this is 62 okay so it's 62 so this is 62 grams per mole okay so now let's look at 62 there is our 62 okay 62 let's use another color maybe so that we don't end up with a graph that is very difficult to interpret okay so let's do our thingy here so we're going to move from 62 into the graph okay gonna do a dotted line so when we get to the graph do you see this reads slightly below because I overshot a bit so do you see this thing it's going slightly 
here just below that line on top over there ne so I want to read that boiling point. I mean, we know that this is essentially going in fours. So this is four, and then if we say this is eight, so that one should be, say, six. So this should be minus six, roughly. So, uh, I'm wasting time before I to. I didn't want this to be longer than 30 minutes, you know. So we know here that, therefore, to answer our thing here. So to answer our thing, we know that the boiling point is going to be minus 6 degrees Celsius, OK? So it's quite low. And how you did it, that's how you do it, OK? This is how you show where you got your minus 6. Make sure you indicate that on the graph so that they can see what is happening all right not a problem and um, that is all I mean you see this is all graphical interpretation it's like you're working with an agile but yeah that is it okay let's move quickly guys we don't have time now the next question says um, Jerome now wants to use the graph from 8.3 to predict the boiling point of chloromethane Chloromethane, that's another haloalkane, okay? Now, sorry, the question says, can Jerome use this graph to accurately determine the boiling point? The answer is a hell no. Why not? Explain your answer. We can just say uh, CH3Cl is a different species of Hello, alkanes. Okay, it's a different species of hello alkanes to fluoro alkanes. And we had no data. We had no data on chloro alkanes. Okay. I think that is the best explanation you can put. You can just say this is a different species. Remember, fluoroalkanes, they all depend, belong to the same genera or genius, which is um, uh, haloalkanes. But they are each different because now that those are different species. So we were exploring the species of fluoroalkanes. Now, chloroalkanes is another species of the same family, so we can look into that. All right. You're hearing me talking about species. I mean, those of you who do biology will know that there are some names to certain bugs, depending on its species name and its genus. The genera becomes, say for example, the, the bug that um, causes TB. It's Mycobacterium tuberculosis, meaning Mycobacterium is the overall name for all bacteria that look alike. We call them Mycobacteria. Then the species name, the specific one now that is causing TB, is essentially tuberculosis. Others are what we call avium intracellulare and many others. Okay, that was just to try and give you an idea of what I'm talking about when I say species and genera. Now, it says now define structural isomers. Okay, now we know that here they have the same molecular formula but different uh, structural formula all right so that continues over there so structural isomers they essentially have the same molecular formula but different um, uh, structural formulae okay not a problem so now it says draw the structural formulae of two structural isomers of fluoropropane. Okay, so let's answer 8.6.2 over here. So we have propane first, then we can put the fluorine over there. Remember, you can roll here to here to here as long as in the first carbon. That is good. And then here we have our hydrogens. 
Okay, that is the first one. The second one, because they wanted two of them. One, two, three. Now we can place this fluorine on the second carbon so that we have hydrogens. Okay, not a big deal. So there we are. Can we then put this fluorine over here? The answer is a hell no, because if you put it here, this becomes the first carbon. So these are the only two isomers that we can actually make. I don't know, things are just trying to fall, and I don't know why trying to make me a little bit upset but I don't want to be upset okay guys let's move now identify the type of structural isomers you have drawn again if you're looking here look at this functional group so to speak it's in two different positions it's in carbon one here and it's in the second carbon so to answer 8.6.3 we can say these are positional isomers okay and that's how you walk away with your 19 marks for this question i hope you guys have enjoyed it and it was a bit mathematic -y. now your mathematical gymnastics here are your best shot you need to be able to do the flips and flops of maths anywhere otherwise if you learn maths to forget it then ish, just quit sciences before it sciences are integrated so there's no shortcuts there. You look for shortcuts too much, I then don't call yourself a science student. Go and do languages or something. Then you can just cram there, and that's it. Here you need to integrate and manipulate, you know. Be in the gymnasium. Okay, write the IUPAC names. Okay, question nine, Ish, I'm running. Write the IUPAC names of the following compounds. So now IUPAC says you first identify the longest chain. Let's see. If we start here and say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, okay? So if we're going this route, so always take time when you're doing that because it can kill you if you don't understand what you do. So there's six carbons. What about when we take this root over here? One, two, three, four, five, six. So if we take the pink root, we still have six carbons. There's going to be an overlap, guys. Don't kill me for it. Just trying to show you that you've got options here. So you see for this one, we've got two possibilities. The longest chain can be this one. It can be that one. But what about when we take the brown one? Let's just use a single line. So if we take this brown one and say this becomes our longest chain, how many carbons will we have here? So the brown one is like that. So let's see. One, two, three, four, five. So it's five carbons. So it can't be this one, definitely. But any one of these long ones, the L or the Z, is possible. Okay, so we know that the longest chain has six carbons, so it's a hexane, because we see no double bonds. So this is a hexane, okay? Now let's have a look. What do we see also? We have a fluorine here, we have another fluorine here, and the rest is uh, hydrogens, okay? Now we always name our carbons closest to the side group, I mean to the functional group or side chains. Now let's have a look. What is the story here? Functional group takes precedence, of course. So this is on carbon number three. They are both on carbon number three, if we are looking, as this one is carbon one. So let's say this is the first carbon, one, two, three, four. It's the fourth carbon, so it doesn't work. One, two, three, four, it doesn't work. So the best one, this is carbon one, then carbon six can either be that one or that one. So it doesn't really matter, honestly. And then now if we say this is our long chain, let's use our L as the long chain. So we have here, first of all, we start by naming these two. So we have three comma three dash 
difluoro difluoro and then of course hexane wait 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 that is not true there's no, there's more there's more uh, now there's a methyl group as well or ethyl group so there's an ethyl group here you win this is dangerous now there's an ethyl group here because there's two it's an ethyl group and then it's an ethyl group so it's on carbon 3 it's on carbon 3 so E comes before F okay so this is not correct so E comes before F so we need to name the ethyl group so it's on the fourth carbon whether we're looking at this one or that one so we have four ethyl okay dash 3,3 dash difluoro hexane okay yeah that name is, is long it's 4 ethyl E comes before this one but I'm not too sure if the D is what you would consider as the first thing sometimes it's a nightmare but I think the name here is fluoro but I don't know with dye then E comes after D so it's a night situ it's a nightmarish situation so I don't know if this is reconciled properly for ethyl difluorohexane I think that is the best way because we can't put ethyl hexane here uh, the, the idea is the fluoro group has to be attached to this one because we call them haloalkanes okay fluorohexane so I think this is the best way you can name this one so of course for naming this and then naming that and then the parent name so I think here to include the die part is the fourth mark so that's how you score your four marks for the first one easy second one says what is this one you have one two three four five so there's five carbons here so it's a pent but now there's two OH groups so it's an alcohol with two hydroxyl groups so now we always name this closest to the side chain so or to the functional group so this one is on carbon if we say this is carbon one this is carbon two because this would be on the third carbon but this one is on the second so this is cool so we're going to say this is uh, two comma three two comma three uh, maybe this is wrong. This is wrong. We don't start with these numbers. We start with the name. This is Pantan. This is one, two, three, four, five. So this is Pantan. Now we have these ones now. Two, comma three. Die. Wall. Yeah. I don't know. 2,3 die all. Yeah, this is crazy, man. Yeah, this is crazy, but this is it. Die all. Maybe let's just write die all. Die all. Say di all. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, guys, you probably don't see this one. Ish. Yeah, ne. Penten. I don't know what I making mistakes now 2,3 diol yes diol so this is pentan 2,3 diol then of course you get the name for this long chain and then for these two 2,3 and then the diol so this is how you score your three marks okay guys I think we are already an hour in but let's just finish up now there's this one one there's four of these and then C O O H sorry C O O H three so you can already tell that this must be some sort of an ester right hmm it must be an ester because there is 
a chain on the other end of the oxygen and then this must be a double bond so this is actually how many there's four plus one is five so this is pentanoate this is pentanoate so this is methyl pentanoate so we start by naming the alkyl group so methyl pentanoate okay this is an ester so again you get the two names methyl pentanoate of course why do I know this I know that this part is the ethano is the pentanoate part okay sorry this COO and then with this one it's a pentanoate and then the methyl all right let's move use molecular formula to write a balanced chemical equation for the complete combustion of propene okay let's try and do this one here 9.3 is here now what is this uh, for propene propene is C okay what did they say molecular formula okay C H 2 C okay let's just not cause ourselves problems let's just do this thing propene can only be here it's between the first and the second carbon even if you put it here it's fine it's one of these asymmetrical thing is so you have your hydrogens hydrogens wait a minute only one there so we've got propene okay so propene is what is C3 H 1 2 3 4 5 6 H 6 okay C3 H 6 and then of course the formula is CN H 2 N so 2 times 3 is 6 I should have just thought about the homologous series 1 and then we are adding oxygen burning it in oxygen so we said molecular formula so not a problem so we know that we get carbon dioxide and water always know the products then you can start working on the balancing now there were three carbons we only have two so let's put three here so that balances out the carbons so we have three carbons three carbons okay what about hydrogens hydrogens were six and then there's two here so let's see if we put two wait three must put three here yeah this thing is irritating me now this is three okay so they are six now we are sorted with the hydrogens but oxygens are not sorted here now we have three we have three plus um, six three plus six is nine so we can just put the coefficient nine there and then we are sorted right because O2 times three is six plus three for here it's nine then that's sorted so this is balanced this is balanced so this is our four marks okay so one mark for each done so this is how we get our four marks all right guys let's go on use condensed structural formulae to write a balanced chemical equation for the reaction between butane and bromine in the presence of uv light hmm. butane and bromine all right not a problem so we can try and do it here so 9.3 so butane and bromine so they said what condensed structural formula so butane is CH3 CH2 uh, CH2 CH3 so this is bromine right you can either make this one times two if you want to make it shorter and then we are adding bromine Bromine is Br2, right? Now, UV light, we know that it 
essentially causes this one to dissociate into the two halides which is PR1 minus so that then there can be some sort of action here so you know that to react alkanes and halogens you need UV light to kind of do this work here then of course you need a little bit of heat okay so that this reaction can take place so always know the requirements please guys so we know that we need UV light and some heat of course UV light will dissociate these two then the heat will break a bond over there and then so that we can have that interaction please when you revise these reactions make sure you know these things and then we're going to continue down here what would be the next one so we know here we're going to have CH3 CH2 CH2 and then BR okay plus the hydrogen that went out is going to take out the other one and form hydrogen bromide okay so this is essentially what they want and we are sorted here we're not going to cause ourselves any difficulties whatsoever this is it for marks of course you get a mark for this one get a mark for this one and then for that one and that one all right not a big deal that is easy so you guys please when you learn these reactions of reacting this is an, a substitution reaction know what are the requirements for this reaction to take place because this is easy but it can cause you a little bit of pain if you don't get it right okay let's quickly do 9.4 and finish this business okay guys I know and it takes slightly more than the time I wanted. I wanted to do this in just one hour, but it could not happen. All right, let's do this one. So consider the three organic reactions. So you'll always have a question on organic reactions. So be ready for them. So first of all, we have a chloroalkane. This is basically chloroethane plus um, potassium hydroxide. So this is a base. You know when you're reacting these with the base you're going to get a situation where you have uh, a substitution reaction isn't it and um, once you substitute the chlorine with the OH you're forming alcohols okay this is the formation of alcohols so what are the requirements for this reaction to take place you know very well you need ethanol so you dissolve the base in ethanol and then you treat it with the haloalkane okay so once you've done ethanol you just need some mild heat okay so these are the requirements for this reaction to take place and then of course this is essentially trying to form uh, alcohols okay so this is an alcohol okay of course knowing very well that this is going to be a primary alcohol because we are reduce we are taking this one from the first carbon so the OH will attach to the second so we're going to have ethanol okay all right don't worry about this one is just to dissolve the base first you dissolve the base in ethanol then you treat it with the haloalkane and then of course you're going to need a little bit of small onion heat you warm the, the reaction okay not a problem we are sorted here what is this one we're having this one is CH2 so it's C2H2N so that is H4 so this is an alkene so this is ethene okay we are going to treat it with a hydrohalogen so this is hydrohalogenation okay so this is an addition reaction of course this one is substitution over here this is going to be sort of an addition reaction okay so what do we form here we're going to form a hollow alkane okay so not a big deal but now what do we need here to form a hollow alkane 
sorry, um, yeah, a hollow alkane from this one. What you need here is that there must be no water. No water allowed. So when you do this, there mustn't be any water because if you have water here, then you're going to hydrolyze this thing and form an alcohol instead. But here we want to form a haloalkane. So this is hydrohalogenation or an addition reaction. So there must be no water there. That is just the only condition for that reaction. Otherwise, it pretty much occurs spontaneously. All right, uh, this is C12H26 again. C12, you know that it's H2N, which is 24 plus 26, so this is an alkane, all right? And then with this alkane, what are you doing? You're splitting it into this one. What is this? C9, H20. 9 by 2 is 18 plus 2 is 20, so this is also an alkane. Therefore, this one must be an alkene. Of course, this is splitting. Not splitting, but cracking. I like to use that word splitting. This is cracking. Cracking is another form of an elimination reaction, sort of like a dissociation type of reaction because you really did not eliminate anything, but what happened is you're forming an alkene and an alkane from a long chain alkane. Okay, easy. Now that we have a bit of an idea of what is happening here, then of course cracking comes in two forms. It's catalytic or thermal. T thermal you can do it in the industry, the catalytic you can actually even perform it in the lab as you saw in your May June exams. They actually gave you a test tube where you put this in a cotton wool, put some, uh, what did they use, the aluminium oxide as a catalyst so that you just need less heat to have it done. So those are just the conditions. You need a catalyst or you can use a lot of heat but high, high, high enough heat. Okay, identify the general, see now the word general type of reaction in A. What did we say? It's a substitution reaction. So that's the general term. Substitution reaction. Okay, great. No problems there. If they said the specific type, what would you say? <laughs> it's hydrolysis, right? Because you're trying to form alcohols. Okay, now write the molecular formula for product X. Now what is product X? We said it's going to be an alcohol. So basically, if we're doing molecular formula, this is going to be C. Now remember molecular, you just count all the C's. So there's only going to be two C's here. It's C2, H, how many H's? There's five H's here, all right? plus the one for the OH, there's going to be six H's. Uh, but I'm not sure if I'm going to be correct. Yeah, let's think about it for a second uh, before I start to make it look like an aldehyde or something. What is this one? The molecular formula, I mean, Molecular doesn't really say too much. It's not a condensed, yeah. It's not condensed, but it's molecular. So there's going to be 5 from there, plus 1, which is going to be 6. So it's H6 ohm. That is it. That's the molecular formula. This one doesn't really tell you too much, but the structural formula does. Okay. Identify the specific type. Now, remember, they don't want the general type. Specific type of reaction B. That is an addition reaction in general, but specifically it's hydrohalogenation because you're adding an HCl. Hydrohalogenation. So that is the name, the specific type, but the general type is addition. Draw the structural formula of compound Y. Okay, compound Y basically is going to be stuff like this. Okay, let's do it here. 9.4.4. Compound Y has how many? There's just two carbons there. So it's one, two. Now, where do we add? Well, we can add the hydrogen here. 
hydrogen, hydrogen. Then maybe add the chlorine over there and then another hydrogen. But remember, even if you took this one there, it is still on the first carbon. It's on the first carbon here, still on the first carbon if you put it, you, you put it there. So remember the symmetrical types of, um, what do you call, um, alkenes. This is symmetrical because the double bond is right here. So you have equal ends. Once it's symmetrical, you don't have to use Makonikov's rule to decide where to put the hydrogens and all that because wherever you put them, it just equalizes nicely. So this is it. That's that's all you have to do here. Great stuff. Okay, not a big deal. Uh, let's go for the next one. Identify the specific type of reaction C. Again, they want the specific type. Specific type is called cracking. Okay, that's cracking. But in general, it's elimination reaction, right? Define a hydrocarbon. Okay, a hydrocarbon is a substance, we can say organic substance, that has only hydrogens and carbon atoms, okay? So basically hydrocarbon is a substance just say an organic substance that has only hydrogen and carbon atoms. Easy definition. Identify the homologous series to which product Z belongs. Now we said that this is going to be alkenes. So a little bit of analysis. Yeah, my writing is dying here. Eh? Alkenes. What is the commercial significance of reaction C? Briefly explain. Well, reaction C is cracking. So basically the commercial significance is that we know here we're breaking long chain alkanes into more usable, so we can say usable short chain alkanes and alkenes. This one's Ben better okay and are used as fuels as you know petrol we produce it like we produce it like this octane is petrol so maybe one of them is gonna be this one this is sort of like nonane <laughs> it's not octane so we're supposed to get non octane but they decided we're gonna just choose the one but even that can still be used. So basically here, this is breaking of long chain alkanes into more usable short chain alkanes and alkenes, which actually bend better and are used as fuels. That is in the production of petrol. That is the commercial significance. They are used as fuels, as a result we use them for petrol. And that's how you would score all those marks. I know guys this one was much longer than I actually wanted to take it but it happened so there's nothing I can do. I hope you've enjoyed the video and that you're going to give it a thumbs up and you're going to hit that notification bell so that you are never going to miss out whenever I post another video and of course you may also consider subscribing so that you become you know a direct beneficiary of all what I'm going to be doing both now and in the near future. Of course, some of you guys are going to see these videos and you're doing grade 11, so you're in a good shot for next year. And I'll do more next year. Probably I'll do some more very f fancy stuff. <laughs> so those who are still to do metric next year are going to be in a good position. And those who are going to do upgrading, should they not be happy with their marks, still going to be in a good position. But those who are already going to do better this year, well, good luck, guys. Keep working hard, and it's now or never, isn't it? All right, I'll see you guys in the next video where I'm just going to be as haphazard as ever. I'm not going to follow a particular pattern from now on because I think we've done enough chemistry and enough physical science as well. So I'll just pick and choose any question that I think is relevant to discuss, be it mathematics, paper one or paper two, or be it physical science, uh, paper one or paper two, 
I'll just be a random guy from now on because I feel like we have done enough in terms of following a particular pattern so if you have been following you should already be comfortable with a lot of things right now otherwise uh, good luck guys with the preparations for the exams I'm going to do maybe some more DBE related work as well so that you don't feel like you were abundant but my advice to you guys don't ignore these IEP papers even if you're writing the DBE exams they will help you you will see that the line of questioning here can actually improve your understanding of your materials and likewise uh, IEP students do not undermine the Department of Basic Education question papers please have a look at them and work on them as well because they will always try to steal ideas from one to the other to try and spice up their work so you may benefit rather directly even so otherwise guys um let's see you in the next video whenever i will drop it i don't know when but yeah soon enough and yeah keep working well and good luck with your preparations for the exams and the actual writing of them as well bye bye